So I, I, I give you Tom Peters, who is the, uh, who's the evangelist for the, uh, for the practice of management. There's no one else like him on earth. Tom. Well, thank you very much. It is a, uh, a great honor, frightening honor in many respects, to uh, have the opportunity to speak to you. My first experience, only experience, with Mrs. Drucker was in 2007 when, surprisingly, the Australian Institute of Management really became the first group of people to put together a multi-day conference on uh, Peter Drucker's work. Now, I had flown to Australia from Boston, and I perhaps am known for my energy, but I got to Sydney, I went to my hotel room, and I slept, which as far as I'm concerned is what human beings are meant to do. When I arrived at the venue later that evening, the first thing I heard is, oh, Doris Drucker is here. She arrived, she toured Sydney, and played tennis. <laughs> and that was it for me. I was pretty much headed home on the next plane. I uh, decided when I heard those words about having sold so many business books, at least I heard the second half, which was about the marketing, and that is there was some genius, Bob, involved in that. About my eighth or ninth book was called The Pursuit of Wow. And somewhere along the way, I got a photograph sent to me by a friend, and he said I was just in the airport in Delhi, and they had The Pursuit of Wow filed with the sex books. <laughs> and so I suspect that that you know, goes a long way toward explaining marketing genius because God alone knows that would not have been a title of one of uh, Peter's books. <laughs> I also must say, and I'm reminded of it constantly, that I am indeed humbled by the impact Peter has made and the absence thereof in my own case. So here I'm headed off to give this speech honoring the very real fact that it is not a silly statement at all to say that Mr. Drucker's contribution ranks with Churchill's and others. And I discovered at 6 o'clock this morning that I have not been able to accomplish the tiniest task known to humankind which has been at the top of my change agenda I was in my hotel, I went to wash my hair, they still don't write the word shampoo on the shampoo bottles. That's the only thing that I've really been serious about for the last 30 years. And you know, on the one hand, you have a guy who changes the way the world works, on the other hand, you poor souls are listening to a speech from a guy who can't get a hotel company to change the damn size of a word on a bottle. And this is particularly of significance to me because tomorrow I will be 68 and now I can barely see the bottles, let alone the words that are on them. Uh, the only other gripe, I must say, that I have with Peter and his and my dear friend Warren Bennis is I am going to be 68 and despite your comments, I do get tired and you got these bloody role models of these guys who go to the year 200 and they keep writing books. I was visiting Bennis last year and I said, Warren, for God's sakes, cut it out. I don't, somebody, somebody interviewed me years ago and they said, it was relative to Peter, and they said, do you think you will, this was long ago, still be writing books when you're 80 and like Peter Drucker? And I said, I hope to God not. <laughs> And I try, I try to quit, but maybe that was the same case with him. Um, well, it's always good to start a speech with a phrase like this, at a party. At a party given by a billionaire on Shelter Island, Kurt Vonnegut informs his pal Joseph Heller 
that their host, a hedge fund manager, had made more money in a single day than Heller had earned from his wildly popular novel, Catch-22, over its whole history. And in fact, Joseph Heller responds, yes, but I have something he will never have enough. And I think that sets the tone for Peter's work and in general as well as anything I could imagine. Now that quote, in fact, comes from a book that is arguably the best book I've read in the last five or ten years and certainly since our uh, economic and financial fiasco began and the book is titled Enough. And it's better than that because the title is actually Enough with a period after it. The most successful person in the world of uh, financial funds is a guy from Philadelphia by the name of Jack Bogle. And Jack is the creator of the Vanguard funds, which have pure index funds, which have outperformed everybody at this stage of the game. Jack wrote this book called Enough, and while I would commend it to your attention, the reality is that you don't have to go much further than the chapter titles. Too much cost, not enough value. Too much speculation, not enough investment. Too much complexity, not enough simplicity. Too much counting, not enough trust. Too much business conduct, not enough professional conduct. Too much salesmanship, not enough stewardship. Too much focus on things, not enough focus on commitment. Too many 21st century values, not enough 18th century values. Too much success, not enough character. My suspicion is that there is not a single word, phrase, semicolon, or comma that could not, in fact, have been written by Peter Drucker. And, in fact, it has been the, the singular honor and equaling or perhaps even surpassing this to have been asked by Jack to write the foreword to the paperback edition of his book. And the only thing that was hard about it was it literally took me a month to write 500 words because I couldn't figure out how you could possibly write words that would introduce somebody to something where the last damn thing you need is the introduction, just go to the chapter title. I mean, if it had been a great forward, it would have said, hey, turn to page five, read the chapter titles, and if you're not hooked by them, you've got a problem. In fact, as we know, as people, as, as our colleagues have cited this morning, this is precisely the same view of the world that Peter took. I'm sure, I, I, I'm almost not wearing what I plan, I'm not wearing what I plan to work this, wear this morning. I live in Vermont, it's hunting season in Vermont. If you're smart, we have hunting seasons followed by hunting seasons. We go from uh, bow and arrow season to main hunting season to muzzle loader season, and we just and then you go across the border to New York State and do the whole damn thing over again. So, but at any rate, I have a bright, brilliant orange jacket that I wear whenever I'm hiking for this six-week period, and I was going to wear it this morning. And what I was going to say was, this orange jacket has nothing to do with hunting in Vermont. It is the closest thing that I could come to which resembles prisoner garbs at L.A. County Jail. And the reason I'm doing that was as I reread Peter over the last couple of weeks, I said, my God, everything I've done, I've stolen from him. <laughs> which isn't entirely fair. I've stolen a little bit from uh, Bennis and so on, but also the, the introduction was perfect. I have said to people many times, I've bragged, I've never had an idea in my life. I go watch other people work and then tell other people, classic example being indeed our good friend, the amazing car dealer, Carl Sewell in, in Dallas and other places. Uh, Carl, which would have in fact fit Peter's notion 
perfectly uh, long ago, 20 years ago, I remember saying, he wrote a book called Customers for Life. There's now been a lot of research about it, which fundamentally has taken a simple concept and made it complex, as so many have done with, uh, you know, with Drucker's work. But basically, Carl said in those days, uh, a Cadillac was going to cost you about $30,000. And he said, fundamentally, if we make the customer happy, he'll be back for another half dozen Cadillacs. So you take 30,000, multiply by seven, and what I tell all of our people from the receptionist on forward is when a customer walks in the showroom, what, they, what you should see on their chest is an invisible sign that says, $210,000, come take it. And of course, the real reality, which we now know from further research, is they're going to tell 10 other people, which takes that $200,000 and immediately vaults it to $2 million. The other thing that's fascinating about the first time I ever went into Carl's dealership on the showroom, there were no cars. All there was was a glorious floral decoration, the likes of which probably not many of us have ever seen. And the logic was twofold. Most of you have undoubtedly heard of the Neiman Marcus stores. Well, Carl didn't have Peter as a consultant, but he did have Stanley Marcus, who in fact designed the showroom. And Stanley said, he was thinking in terms of those $210,000 again, Stanley said, what you want to do is welcome people into the Sewell Village family, not sell them a piece of tin with four rubber tires. Uh, on top of that, and I don't want to spend the whole day on Sewell, but it's so easy. The other thing Carl did was buy a street sweeper. No negativity intended toward public works in Dallas, but he said, the first thing anybody sees when they come visit my dealership is the road in front of the dealership. And when they see a road that hasn't been washed or cleaned or has trash on it, they don't say, my God, it's the Dallas Public Works Department. They say, look at that car dealership with the crap in front of it. And so from flowers in the showroom to, the, to that, uh, it went, goes on. Well, I had my... I, I'm, I'm particularly excited about this opportunity because unlike Peter, but like probably many of my peers and many, many academics, uh, I wrote a book called In Search of Excellence, and a lot of people bought it. And it had 325 pages, but like Jack Bogle's book, it could have been summarized very quickly, and that is we said all you need to know in life is people, customers, action, and values. And it was a good message, whether whatever. And what happened was over the next 25 years, I complicated it and complexified it and followed my own little paths to the point where I couldn't find the damn thing anymore. And then a marvelous thing happened to me, and that is I was invited, B, to this program in Australia where I had to attempt in a modest way to live up to some of the things Peter had done, and A, prior to that, I was, I was invited to speak in Siberia. And, you know, Siberia, I mean, first of all, you can sneer, but you shouldn't, because the city I went to was the chief science city, and so there were probably more, more IQ points in the room that I talked to than there would have been in Cambridge or Palo Alto. Uh, but fundamentally, they weren't very business-oriented. And so I went to Siberia, and you know, as I said to them, I said, look, I'm an American, and you'll have to excuse me being a little bit nervous today. Because if you're an American and you think of Siberia, you think of people going there, but you sure as hell don't think about them coming back. And so my contention is that if you go visit Siberia and you don't say, what in the world am I doing and in Siberia, you should go see a mental health professional. 
Uh, now, Ira and I spend a lot of our time in places like Boston and Vermont, but should you get the urge to visit Siberia, this photograph is taken from the side window of my Air Siberia plane as it came in to Novo Bersic, and this is late April. A, it's late April, and B, it's a color picture. <laughs> well, the next, even given the context of this, this meeting, the, the next slide may sound a little flowery, and there is an asterisk which says, at its best, but I wanted to talk about enterprise as it could be. And, and so I wrote this. I said, business at its best is an emotional, vital, innovative, joyful, creative, entrepreneurial endeavor that elicits maximum concerted human potential in the wholehearted service of others. And it doesn't happen very often, whether it's a car dealership or a corner tea shop or a giant institution. But my point, and this is why I'm loud, Bob, I don't see an excuse for this not being an aspiration. I mean, take each one of the words on that slide and come up with the reverse. Do we want it to be unjoyful? Do we want it to be unvital? Do we want it to be unemotional? And the answer is one word at a time, of course we don't. And so as I said again, and I will say again, I'm not saying it happens all the time. What I am saying is, what's the point of getting up in the morning? And you know, my, my logic there, and I think it's a little bit connected with some of Peter's views about people individually, is you can be the most family-oriented person on earth, but the simple reality is that you are going to spend the majority of your adult waking hours in an enterprise. And you, I don't care, I mean, I just look at it as the engineer I am. If you throw away the, that majority, then you have de facto technically thrown your life away. Period. I don't see how you get around that logic. I, uh, my friend Ken Blanchard, my college roommate Ken Blanchard, wrote about raving fans, and I used the word wow as if it were a grain of sand, and he's not going to change, and I'm not going to change, but I have fallen re-in love, and my good friend Jim Strock is here, who has written about this most recently. I've fallen in love with the word serve and service. You don't need anything more than that. I'm not cutting out the wows. And Ken is not going to cut out raving fans, and there is some value to it, but fundamentally it's all about service. Organizations exist to serve, period. No other reason. Some form or other, leaders live to serve, period. Now I'm going to take you through a little riff of mine, and the little riff is what I fundamentally believe, and though there are many, many, many differences between Peter and myself, I think and I hope that down deep it's the same idea. Uh, it is about institutions caring for people and delivering value. Period. All stop. I mean, it was hilarious after writing In Search of Excellence. I would go speak to 5,000 people in a trade association. And I would stand in front of them, and I was a young man, I was vigorous, I'm kind of an old wimp by now, and I would say, people are important! And 4,900 people would bend over and take a note. <laughs> no, but listen, you know, we act, I visited probably the best hospital in America last Friday. Griffin Hospital in Derby, Connecticut. They are the leaders of something called patient-centered care. And I love it, and what they do is just fabulous beyond words. But, I mean, what other kind of care is there? I mean, we know the answer to that, but it's like, I mean, I spend my life doing things I shouldn't have to do. A people-centered organ, I said to somebody, okay, you are talking to Phil Jackson, 
all right? And you're me. And you say, Phil, I've made a discovery in my management consulting. Players are important. <laughs> it's the same deal, isn't it? You know, I've said many times, I see utterly no difference between the Los Angeles Lakers, who are having lived in the North, Northern California for 35 years, the world champion San Francisco Giants, God bless them. <laughs> yes! Sorry, couldn't resist. I just got, I've now been kind of in Vermont, and if you're in Vermont, you're required to love the Red Sox. And I try, and I go to playoff games, and I go to World Series games, and I grew up with the Washington Senators and the Baltimore Orioles, and I just watched my interest in baseball wane, and I realized how alive it was during this last month. I, I you know, I'm a Barry Bonds fan. I go the whole night. Hey, fair is fair. If Clemens is on steroids, then the batter gets to be on steroids, right? <laughs> Sorry, that's not a druckerism, to put it mildly. We'll, we'll cast that one aside. We'll cast that one aside. At any rate, I think we're talking about the same thing here. I call it the 7-H theory of everything. All you need to know in life. Conrad Hilton at a gala celebrating his career was asked, what was the most important lesson you have learned in your long and distinguished career? His immediate answer, and the way it was given, as I understand it, he was a, he was a towering, elegant-looking man, and he was invited up at this ceremony celebrating his career and squared himself away behind the podium, responding to this question, said, remember to tuck the shower curtain into the bathtub. And with that, he turned and walked off the stage. Now, I think there's some of me in that, and I think there's some of Peter Drucker in that. Uh, you know, Peter talked about the customer. Peter talked about the business purpose. But what he talked about was responding to that purpose. And the simple reality is, I will go to the hotel because of location, location, location. I will come back to the hotel because the shower curtain is tucked into the bathtub. Larry Bossidy, who ran Allied, was Jack Welsh's vice chairman of GE, set execution. It, see, I don't get this stuff. I know this literature. It is said that I wrote the first dissertation at the Stanford Business School on the topic of implementation. There are 7,942 books on self-managing teams in Kaizen. There's not one book other than Larry's that has the single one word title execution. I mean, but what else is there? I want that, you know, also in my San Francisco days, Bob, when we were regularly pounding the hell out of the Cowboys, <laughs> the Joe Montana days, the Jerry Rice days, I got to know Bill Walsh the San Francisco 49ers coach pretty well. And right before Bill passed away, he went through a series of interviews and they were published in a book. And all of this stuff, I just, I love the title of the book, which was The Score Takes Care of Itself. If the discipline is there, if the preparation is there, if the practice was superb, then sometimes the ball will bounce the wrong way, sometimes it'll bounce the right way, but fundamentally the team's record will be what it should be. Jack Welsh himself, who was known as the business strategy guru, said it equally brilliantly. In real life, strategy is actually very straightforward. Pick a general direction and then implement like hell. And I'm a reasonably good military historian. There are two people who I admire more than any others. Horatio Nelson, I'm an old Navy guy, and Ulysses Grant. And they had some interesting things in common relative to execution. First of all, first of all, Nelson was the best sailor in the Royal Navy. Grant was the best horseman in the United States Army. 
And fundamentally, the only strategy that either one of them have is just keep moving. I actually, when I became a student of grants, I came to appreciate my wife more. My wife, usually it's the male, but my wife is one of those, in my opinion, astonishingly irritating human beings <laughs> who will be stuck in traffic, and you can go back a quarter of a mile and avoid the traffic, and she won't. Peter Drucker talked about morals. My wife talks about moral virtue. She said, you never go backwards. And that was Grant. Grant said, you never go back, period. Nelson did the same thing. Now, there's this book called Blue Ocean Strategy. I'm sure some of you love it. I don't. I think it's absurd. I think finding a blue ocean and doing business in it is a fabulous idea, except guess what, friends and neighbors? It is 2010, and if you find a blue ocean and you perform well, within six and a quarter nanoseconds, the whole world will have jumped into your blue ocean, and the only way you keep that ocean blue is by superb execution. And so this is my bias. Internal organizational excellence is, in fact, the deepest of the blue oceans. It's how you execute. I worked in the White House back in 1973 on drug abuse issues, and my boss was a guy by the name of Fred Malik, who had a successful career in the uh, private sector before becoming the number two guy at OMB. And Fred's three-worder that I remembered forever is execution is strategy. You know, the sort of the Michael Porter view of the world is get the strategy right and the implementation will follow. My view, which is not entirely druck druckarian, I would admit, is get the execution right and it doesn't matter what the hell your strategy is. Now, neither one is appropriate. Trust me, I'm not a total idiot. But if I had to place my money more on one than the other, I would place it on execution. So we moved to Howard. Howard Schultz, Starbucks founder, chief executive officer, has had a rough time lately. On the other side of the coin, neither you nor I started selling coffee and ended up with 15,000 shops around the world. Like, we should have such problems. He has an enormous company, he collects more information than God has. He's got a great staff, and yet he says religiously, and I asked him to confirm that it wasn't hype, is come hell and high water, he visits a minimum of 25 shops a week. And his comment is, the data is the data, but basically we make our money by one Starbucks employee selling one cup of coffee to one customer and unless I can see it and feel it and smell it and touch it, then I really don't know what's going on. Somebody had attended a leadership conference a while back who attended a conference of mine, and I don't know who gave it, but it was somebody who was a big deal in the world of leadership, and they had gone through this little drill, and the instructor had said, who is your number one enemy? And the answers had been predictable. You know, it was the competition, it's technological change, and he said, no, it's your desk. It is sticking by, and, and the problem is, this is one where you can't raise hell. Why didn't you go out? Because you were doing precisely what you were paid to do. You know, you're going to visit your seven shops this week, but by 8.17 on Monday, a personnel problem has come up. Now you get that settled, and it's a quality problem. And suddenly it's Friday afternoon at 6 o'clock, and next week you'll visit those seven shops. I remembered that when the yogurt hit the fan a couple of years ago. At a seminar that I gave, there was a chief executive officer of a middle-sized Midwestern independent community plus bank. And, and, and my, I mean, the, the, the fascinating thing about getting older is you don't remember what city you're in but you remember what you were wearing on your fifth birthday. And I remembered this as clear as a bell. This guy had said to me, Tom, let me tell you the definition of a good lending officer. 
after church on Sunday on the way home with his family, he takes a little detour to drive by the factory he just lent money to. Doesn't go in or any such thing, just drives by and takes a look. And literally, if that had happened in 19, 2005 and six, we would have discovered that a lot of the things you lent money to didn't exist or they were rotting or they were unoccupied because the person who you lent $500,000 to was actually out on the street building fires. And look, I'm not an idiot. Of course it's more complicated than that. But somewhere right down near the bottom of the piles of fundamentals is that. The reason that Bob Waterman and I wrote In Search of Excellence was that we were working for McKinsey in San Francisco. We were asked by Royal Dutch Shell to look at companies that worked. And the good news is that we had a little company or a middle-sized company 25 miles down the road from our San Francisco office called Hewlett Packard. Uh, grown a little since then. And so we went down to visit HP and we went down to visit with their president, John Young, president of a company to Bob and I who worked with big New York banks, meant somebody who had three levels of Praetorian guard between them and you, and it took months to arrange the, the meetings. I was the junior guy, so Bob said, you call HP. This was not the age of Google. I looked in the phone book. I looked up the number for HP. I called Hewlett Packard from the San Francisco office. I said, can I speak to John Young? This guy comes on the line and says, who's this? I said, who's this? He said, it's John Young. I was two weeks away from being prepped with a question. <laughs> At any rate, when we talked to John, he revealed to us this magical Hewlett Packard term, managing by wandering around. And fundamentally to me, the reality is it's a fabulous term, but it has become a metaphor for all good things in life. And all good things in life meaning always being in touch, never losing touch. And we had a funny thing happen. After the book started selling well, we got our full three and a half minutes on Good Morning America to tell our life story. And so Bob and I were in a hotel in New York City, and we were having a little chat. And Waterman turns around to me, and he said, okay. He said, who gets to say it on national television? And I said, what? He said, we both love MBWA. Who gets to say it? on national television. We flipped the coin, Bob won, and I'm still pissed off 30 years later. <laughs> That's why I've given all these speeches, to make up for that one bad coin toss. This stuff and is just so basic. I was doing some work out in Colorado at some keen thing for uh, the limited many years ago and having lunch with the CEO and founder, Les Wexner. And he told me a story. He said he was invited to a White House dinner. Les is a multi-billionaire, but he still darn well remembers he's from Columbus, Ohio. He does not have a single molecule of arrogance about him. And he attended a White House dinner and he said, it's out of my league. He said, and then they sat me, this will date the thing a little bit, next to Henry Ford, Jr., who was still alive. He said, then I knew I was out of my league. He said, Henry Ford spends three hours telling me about the shakes, the prime ministers, and the presidents who he has met. And he said, I'm sitting there sinking further and further into my chair. He said, I went home, and, and I do know Les a little bit, and I don't think he exaggerates, and I think he was very serious. He said, I went home and about three, went, sorry, went back to my hotel in D.C., three o'clock in the morning, I woke up with a start. It suddenly occurred to me that in the space of two or three hours, Henry Ford had never mentioned cars once. And it wasn't a marketing meeting or a product development meeting in any sense of the word, but if you're totally psyched by your product, whether it's a one-person accountancy or a 
car selling company or Harley Davidson, you don't go three hours without mentioning the it. And it's a cousin of the MBWA thing, I think. This is called, I, I just, ha I mean, it sort of fits here, but it is such a ridiculous U-turn by Jack Welsh that I, this is just the little hilarity slide. As we all know, Jack helped significantly in our pursuit of wretched excess, believing that shareholder value was actually the only thing that counted. Now, under, under the influence of his new spouse, he says, on the face of it, shareholder value is the dumbest idea in the world. Shareholder value is a result, not a strategy. Your main constituencies are your employees, your customers, and your products. Now, Peter Drucker could have said that. I'm not quite that good. I might have said some of it, but Jack Welsh couldn't have said that. But, you know, what I, I mean, as I said, this has a little to do with the presentation and everything to do with the fact that I just love this quote because it kind of makes me laugh. Herb. Herb is the indefatigable, recently retired chairman, co-founder, and chief executive officer of America's miracle company, otherwise known as a profitable airline, or Southwest Air. There's a wonder, wonderful story about Richard Branson, where somebody said to Mr. Branson one time, how do you become a millionaire? And he said, be a billionaire and buy an airline. <laughs> and it would be funny if it was funny. At any rate, Herb is retiring after 37 years of service. And at his retirement party, he was asked by some member of the press, what is your secret? And Herb apparently gave the same and the only answer he will give to that question. And it is the same answer he's given for years and years. And he said, you have to treat your employees as customers. A funny thing happened at that meeting. Two giant airlines in Dallas, right? American Airlines, Southwest Airlines, by sheer unplanned coincidence, both of them have their annual meeting on the same day. The American Airlines annual meeting is picketed by members of the Airline Pilots Association. The same ALPA, the very self-same ALPA, digs into the members' union dues, spends hundreds of thousands of dollars to take out double-page advertisements in places like USA Today and the Wall Street Journal, thanking Herb for his 37 years of service. Percentage, percentage of unionization at Southwest is exactly the same as it is at American, about 85%. 37 years, total days, hours lost to work stoppage, Southwest Airlines, zero. I love this when I came across it. This is just the same thing in different words. If you want staff to give great service, then you have to give great service to staff. Now, I am not sure if Peter would approve of the following, but maybe. The saving grace is it butchers the English language. I have come to believe, and I spent five years saying the opposite, that the customer comes second. And I believe that if you want the customer to come first, then the person who serves the customer has to come more first. And that's an awful configuration of words, but it is the case in my opinion. Dave Linegar, the founder of Remax, said the same thing in a way that I absolutely love. He said, we are a life success company. Our goal, of course, is to provide extraordinary service to our customers. But fundamentally, my goal is to make my agents and brokers successful. This is like asking Phil Jackson if players are important. That's the brand. And you know, sports is a good example. You spend a half a billion dollars on the world's most gorgeous stadium, and for the first four years, the stadium is full, right? At the end of four years, the record of the team that plays in the stadium is significantly below 500 ball, and guess what? The stadium starts to empty out. Proof of the pudding being that the Boston Red Sox have had something like what, Ira? 87,319 consecutive sellouts in the most wonderful but crappiest state stadium that exists on earth. 
I hate mission statements. And we're kind of responsible with In Search of Excellence. And I'm nervous about it, especially with my birthday coming up. You know, I'm, if I even get a trial run, I'm going to get up there to St. Peter. And he's going to say, aren't you the guy who invented mission statements? And, of course, then I'm going to do what I did with MBWA and say, no, it was Waterman. <laughs> but I must admit that I do love this one. It comes from the giant London-based market. It's services company WPP. Our mission to develop and manage talent, to apply that talent throughout the world for the benefit of clients to do so in partnership and do so with profit. There is no issue whatsoever that profit is incredibly important, comma, but it is a derivative phenomenon. I lived those 35 years in Silicon Valley. I am not naive at my age. I do not deny that Larry Ellison likes to keep score with his net worth, but I do not know a single one of those people in Silicon Valley who succeeded who went into it for the money. They went into it like Steve Jobs to change the world, and indeed the money followed, and they're not ashamed of it. I love profit. The only thing I love more than profit is obscene profit. <laughs> With obscene profit, you can hire obscenely talented people and take on incredibly interesting projects. Now, I didn't write this. My keyboard did. Now, this was actually written for my speech in September of 2007 at the Australian Institute of Management honoring Peter Drucker. And I'm going to tell you the truth, which I hate to do in this room. I hadn't quite read as much Drucker as I should have. And I spent a month reading almost everything. And as all of you have said, what I became overwhelmed with was indeed his commitment to the arts of management, his commitment to the serious values that Jack Vogel, among others, has expressed so much. And so I don't know if this is right, but I've been using it. And I said, organizations are no less than cathedrals in which the full and awesome power of the imagination and spirit and native entrepreneurial flair of diverse individuals is unleashed in passionate pursuit of excellence. We're not talking religion here, lowercase c. As I said when I was in Saudi Arabia, I didn't use the word mosque because I was afraid I'd get in trouble, but you know what I mean. I said, I don't have any problem dissing the Catholics. Uh, an old Presbyterian, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> the Pope gets in trouble about two years ago for giving a speech somewhere saying Islam is a violent religion. I said, speaking as a Protestant, as I recall, the Catholics had quite a little bit of fun roasting some of my ancestors over the fires for 100 years or so. So let's watch out when pots call kettles black. Uh, but this is true to me. This is obvious if it is a school classroom, right? But my point is that the role of the organization is to develop human talent. I wrote this next one a while back, and I will only read it in part. I called it the Oath of Office for Managers and Servant Leaders. Our goal is to serve our customers brilliantly and profitably over the long haul. Serving our customers brilliantly and profitably over the long haul is the product of brilliantly serving over the long haul the people who serve the customer. Hence, our job as leaders, the alpha, the omega, and everything in between is abetting the sustained growth and success and engagement and enthusiasm and commitment to excellence of those one at a time who directly or indirectly serve the customer. I don't see what else it can be. The leader's goal is not to be the best strategist, it's to hire the best strategist and develop the best strategist. And this is, with my perhaps unapt interpretation, is a different way of looking 
I ha see, I had, a, I had an epiphany 24 hours ago. And when somebody says like that, something like that, reach for your wallet. But I was reading the practice of management, and I don't disagree with a single word that was said before me, but what came across to me, and many of my colleagues here have been engaged in this study for years or decades, was what Peter did is he grasped the whole enterprise. He kind of put his arms around it, and nobody else has done that. I mean, it's like the whole thing is there, which doesn't mean you're going to absorb it, and maybe you absorb it kind of in ways you don't even understand, but it's like the whole deal, and it's what enterprise is all about. And, and I do raise my voice because I don't talk about anything interesting. I just talk about stuff like MBWA, you know, like the lending officer drives by the place who, you know, which he lent money to. This is not rocket science. In fact, those with rocket science degrees or MBAs from Stanford or Harvard, one of which I have, I, I really got it in for MBAs. I think, Doris, I could give Peter a run on that one. You know, so, and this is what you all are doing here, which is precisely the opposite. There was some magazine article somewhere, Ira, five or six years ago, interviewing deans. And they were asking questions like, you know, why don't you teach the people stuff? Why don't you teach the integrity stuff? And one dean, to me, gets perfect marks. And he said, you know, that's very difficult. That was the only honest answer in the lot. Uh, I mean, I said to somebody, I said, you know, I'm feeling better and better by the day about competing with the Chinese. They're building business schools now. <laughs> Henry the First. I have now written 16 books, and otherwise that is a complement of books that probably covers any given three-year part of Peter Drucker's life. To me, it's a big deal. In fact, we took one book and tore it into four pieces and published it as four more books because you know, I thought, my God, I can't quite come in in the second leg on this, but I will. Anyway, the most, for me, the most difficult part of writing a book is choosing the epigraph. You got to find 20 words written or spoken by someone else that perfectly captures what's been on your mind for the last four or five years. And after 16 tries, I finally got one right in my most recent book, The Little Big Things. And it comes from Henry the First or Henry Clay. Courtesies of a small and trivial character are the ones which strike deepest in the grateful and appreciating heart. And I spent five years collecting stories Stories of major turning points in history that were determined by somebody being kind to someone else or not. We gained our independence in 1783 because we won a battle in Yorktown, Virginia in 1781, right? Why did we win the battle? We won the battle in 1781 because there were two British generals by the name of Clinton and Cornwall. Cornwall Cor sorry, Cornwallis. Cornwallis ordered Clinton to come to his assistance from New York, and Cornwallis was the guy in charge. And we know in the military when somebody gives an order to somebody else, they follow it. If Clinton and Cornwallis had come to Yorktown, the British flag would be flying over Claremont. But it turned out that Clinton and Cornwallis were pissed off at each other. And so Clinton said, I ain't coming down from New York. And we beat him. And for those of you who pick on the French upon occasion, by the way, this is a just gratuitous thing thrown in. We won at Yorktown, right? We won at Yorktown. There were 36,000 soldiers in Yorktown, 7,000 Americans, 29,000 French. So I always on 
the 4th of July, send all my French friends emails and say, thanks, you know, you guys did it. How did we get the French to do it? Because of an old, ugly guy who went to Paris, charmed the ladies, and drank tea by the name of Benjamin Franklin. That stiff-necked New Englander, John Adams, thought that Franklin was an absolute immoral disaster, but he charmed the French. And then we got lucky enough to win a battle against about three people in Saratoga, New York. And Franklin made it sound like Hannibal crossing the Alps, and the French signed up. Um, this is, I'm working on this area. It's become the biggest thing in a way in my life. A guy by the name of Jerome Groupman, Harvard MD, Harvard Med School professor, wrote a book called How Doctors Think. And he makes a comment early on. He said, if you're dealing with a doctor and you have a medical problem, what is the doctor's best sort of evidence? And he answers you. You have a 30-minute conversation. Most of what you're going to say is utterly stupid, but within the 30 minutes, you will give off 10 or 12 little tips that are of enormous value to the doctor, right? So, Groupman cites solid academic research. Question, on average, when does the doctor interrupt the patient? Eighteen seconds. And we're not here to talk about doctors and patients, but my strong suspicion is that this room is loaded with what I call 18-second managers. That is just as bad. And I'm not pots calling kettles black because I've never made it to close to 18 <laughs> seconds myself. But so I started thinking about this, and people like Steve and Covey have made it a staple of their work over the last 20 years, and I'm making it a staple of mine. But I started thinking about the word listen. And I'm not going to go through all this, but that's what listening is. The ultimate mark of respect, is it not? I had a most amazing experience about a year ago. I'm in Helsinki. I'm giving an interview to a, to a reporter. I read, the rep I read the interview three weeks later. I can't believe what I told that reporter. I mean, things that I would not tell a priest who'd taken his vows. And I'm thinking, I said, what in the hell went on? I, I don't drink, so it wasn't booze. And then I realized what it was. I talked to that reporter for 30 minutes, and he never stopped nodding his head. And worst of all, he took notes. <laughs> but what does nodding the head mean? It means you are saying something that is so significant. More. And the notes, what you are saying is worthy of me getting every word and semicolon correctly. I've done, I've done 3,000 interviews probably. I would, you know, if it had gone another half hour, I admit, would have admitted to serial murders. I have no, just to keep this guy nodding. You know, somebody said flattery will get you everywhere. They're right. Somebody said you can't, you, you know, don't flatter somebody too much. They're wrong. But isn't this true? Listening, heart and soul of engagement, kindness, thoughtfulness, collaboration, partnership, team sport, developable individual skill. See what I don't understand about management, and I think that's what's happening to a significant degree in this school, and that is all the things that are important to a leader, like talking, like listening, like kindness, like saying thank you. We assume that we're good at those. In my opinion, you should study listening as hard as you would study playing a cello. It is a discipline, to use the word that Peter liked best. It is a profession, to use a word that he liked equally well. It's what leaders do, or rather don't do. But it's the whole thing is ridiculous. My life is ridiculous. 
You know, I talk to two adults who are wildly successful and say you could be six times more successful if you'd shut your mouth and open your ears. <laughs> and on it goes, page after page. Execution, making the sale, keeping the customer's business, service, network development, maintenance, expansion, learning, renewal, creativity, innovation. What more do you want? Is there any attribute more significant relative to these things than listening? If so, let me know. Send me an email, tjpet at aol.com. Or if you want to do it on Twitter, Tom underscore Peters. We didn't use the words Peter used, and I'm not entirely sure he would have approved 100%, but I think he would. I mean, Bob and I were McKinsey guys in 1982. In the world of the consultants, the McKinsey people, et cetera, everything was strategy. And we did not fit. Bob and I were both engineers. I'm a civil engineer. He was a mining engineer. We love numbers. In an out-and-out -out race, I could nail you on regression analyses or any other statistical technique known to humankind, as could the guy I trained at McKinsey, Jeff Skilling. <laughs> and what we said is the real soft stuff, as we've learned from Wall Street, Enron, WorldCom, and so on, is the plans and the numbers. The real hard stuff is the people, the customers, the values, and the relationships. Henry II, or Henry Ross Perot. These are perhaps my three favorite words in the world of business. Ross Perot, Ross Perot sold EDS to General Motors, as many of you will recall, went on the board at General Motors, and was famously asked by Fortune magazine a year or two later, please compare General Motors and EDS. He said, at EDS, our strategy is ready, fire, aim. At General Motors, the strategy is ready, aim, 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 aim. Business Week magazine, bless you. Business Week magazine did a study of the best innovators a couple of years ago, and they said that the ones who are at the top of the list experiment fearlessly. You don't learn nothing until you do something. As my friend, the MIT professor Michael Schrag said, it's all about the product prototypes because the innovation is not the idea, it's the reaction to the prototype. You've got to have something to shoot at. Whether it's a new model for software or for an automobile. High-tech executive who attended a seminar of mine years ago from Outer Philadelphia said that his secret to success was a strategy that he calls fail forward fast. I've long argued, and I really believe it in my heart, that whatever it is I'm doing, I've been doing for 45 years. Since I arrived as a Navy ensign in Da Nang, Vietnam, one night in 1966. And in 45 years, I have had the incredible pleasure, treasure, joy, and good luck to learn one thing. And the one thing that I really believe is whoever tries the most stuff wins. Years ago, I had a house on a little island off the East Coast called Martha's Vineyard. I had a neighbor. One of the most deadly of sins is envy. I'm not an envy guy. I must admit, I envied this guy. He had something in his closet that I didn't. He had a Nobel Prize. He won it in medicine. His name was Joe Murray. He did the first successful organ transplant. Joe was the most rare of human beings on earth called a humble Nobel laureate. <laughs> I've known a few. And I got to know him pretty well. 
he was in his 70s or 80s. <laughs> I asked him one time, I said, Joe, first of all, I used to tease him. The actual procedure where he finally took the kidney out, I mean, did the transplant successfully, was 42 minutes. I said, Joe, you only work 42 minutes in your whole bloody life and you have a Nobel Prize. And I said to him at one point, I said, what's the secret? And he looked at me with a little smile and he said, we did more procedures. You know, the way I like to put it is in the world of Nobel laureates, whether it's economics or medicine, you know that like probably the odds are high that one of these five people is going to win, right? We kind of know what the area is of interest. So we have these five people sitting in front of me. I will not point to them individually because I don't want to embarrass them or irritate them. One of these five is a heck of a lot smarter than the other four incredibly smart people, okay? This one of the five is so smart that he or she doesn't actually have to do anything. And one of them, who I won't point to either, you know, they're all smart, but one of them is, you know, as they say, a couple cards short of a full deck. The one who's the dumb one is so dumb that he decides he's got to actually do operations to figure out what he's up to. Well, Joe is a million miles from being a dumb guy. He's an incredibly smart guy, but it's what happens in every ball game. We said that, I mean, in search of excellence was about these eight basics. And the first one in 1982 is the one that's even more first than it was in 1982. And that's what Bob and I said, the number one problem with big enterprises is too much talk and too little do. You do the analysis, but it would be nice to have something to analyze. I got so bloody irritated. I was in the Albany airport about a year ago, and there was a Harvard Business Review. And it had a little gold star on it featuring an article, which is actually written by a good friend. And it said, mapping your competitive position. And I got furious, which is ridiculous. I know him. I like him. I respect him. And it was a good article. But I wrote this thing, which I obviously can't go through with you. You can find it at my website if you want, that I called the Have You 50. And I said, instead of mapping your competitive position, what if you went to work and called two customers? And a whole list has got 50 things like that. I love mapping a competitive position, but wouldn't it be nice to have data? I read this article, I don't know whether any of you read the New Yorker, there was an article about Mickey Drexler, former head of the Gap, now head of J. Crew, miracle worker. The magic of Mickey Drexler is he finds a data point, he knows it's not a full set, and he tries something. And then he has this shocking intelligence. If he tries it and it works, he does it again. If he tries it and he doesn't work, he doesn't do it again. And this is why he has a net worth of a billion dollars, and you and I don't. Shay, as in Tony, as in Zappos founder. I just, I just love plain English. Isn't that nice? Zappos 10 corporate values. Deliver wow through service. Embrace and drive change. Create fun and a little weirdness. Be adventurous, creative, open-minded, pursue growth and learning, build open and honest relationships, communication, build a positive team and family spirit, do more with less, be passionate and determined, and be humble. I do acknowledge it, and it's those 30 years in Silicon Valley. I do like extreme language. I do like Steve Jobs, who says that, in fact, the only way a product will be launched is if it hits insanely great. I do love it that I was in Rome at Easter two years ago, and rather than perhaps being quite as reverential as I should have been, I was mostly excited by a BMW ad for one of their new models that was described on the billboard as radically thrilling. I mean, these are Germans who are not precisely known for overstatement. I am one, by the way, so I can say things like that. And there's my friend Kevin Roberts, consumer goods guy, now CEO of Saatchi and Saatchi Worldwide. His, his credo, ready, fire, aim, if it ain't broke, break it, hire crazies, ask dumb questions, pursue failure, lead, follow, get out of the way, spread confusion, ditch your office, read odd stuff, and above all, avoid moderation.
The best reason to avoid moderation is go find yourself a history book. Find me a moderate in a history book. Whether it's politics, war, arts, or anything else. The definition of somebody who makes it into a history book, country of your choice, is a freak who didn't buy the act. One of my favorite quotes that I use of Peter Drucker's, in fact, is an old one. I don't know where it comes from. I can't get it entirely, given my age. But it was, whenever, whenever I find anything being done, it is always being done by a monomaniac with a mission. Helgeson, as in my friend and colleague, Sally. Sally, about 15 years ago, said, Tom, the time has come for you to learn about women. <laughs> and she took me to a meeting, and it lasted three hours, and it was mostly women business owners, crazy quilt combination. Judy George, who ran Domain, who founded Domain Home Fashion, was one. The woman whose name I don't remember now, who was the first female driver of an Indy 500 car, a senior person at Disney. And for three hours, they regaled me with tales, no tears, no emotion, of the way in which women who buy virtually everything were treated as invisible, dumb, etc., by doctors, lawyers, car dealers, to put it mildly, and they told me some stories, and I told their stories over, and I started collecting stories, and I went from dismay to shock to anger, and I've been angry for 15 years. I'm not angry because I believe in social justice. If I do, that's my business, and I do it in my own time. I'm angry because of stupidity. The Economist magazine, another organ not given to wretched excess, put it nicely, I thought. Forget China, forget India, forget the internet. Economic growth is driven by women. Since 1970, two out of every three jobs filled in the world, for example, have been filled by women. Nobel Peace Prize winner in 2006, Muhammad Yunus, father of micro-lending, lends 94% of his money to women. Why? You want to know why? It's not a happy story for you and me. Lend 50 bucks to a guy, he drinks it up, lend it to a woman, and she starts a business and does something with a community. And that's a nasty thing to say about any of the four or five of us. It's only saving graces, it's true. Another article I found even put more numbers on it. Women's economy, women's market power is more than two times higher than China and India combined. And yet still only one out of ten companies get it. Women now drive global economy global. They control about 20 trillion in consumer spending, and that figure declines. Maybe look at the numbers. They're high. They're outrageous. I have what I call the squint test. I am not in favor of quotas in any way, shape, or form. They may have served their value and virtue at a time. They don't. But I still apply the squint test. And my squint test is I look at the board or I look at the executive committee and does it look kind of like the market being served? PepsiCo, for example, and one thinks of the great state of California, has discovered PepsiCo, a corporation, has discovered that there are Hispanics. If you looked at the average board of directors or executive team of a large company, you would discover that that is a startling discovery. The woman who runs the Women's Forum for Economy and Society put it this way. For a number of, uh, one thing is certain, women's rise to power, which is linked to increase in wealth per capita, is happening in all domains at all levels of society. Women are no longer content to provide efficient labor, be consumers with rising budgets, da 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 da. This is just the beginning. For a number of observers, we have already entered the age of womenomics, the economy as thought out and practiced by women. One of the reasons I love being 68, and you're not, is it's kind of over for guys. You know, we had our 10,000 years or so. <laughs> but it's like, game over, my man. <laughs> Bless you. Good luck. 
I don't quite mean it, but I sort of mean it. And part of it, as you know, is not funny at all. Uh, we have a little college near where I live called Castleton College. Uh, at the baccalaureate level, 55% women matriculate, 74% graduate. Guys are dropping out. They're not going to begin with. And it's a horrible problem, as well as on this dimension, an opportunity. Business Week magazine put it this way. As leaders, women rule. New studies find that female managers outperform. I have a computer, my regular computer, that says women are born to lead. Well, you can snicker, Richard, but it wasn't that funny last week because I really wasn't sure what would happen if the customs guy looked at it in Riyadh. I wasn't sure that it would amuse. I, I carefully kept it upside down. I wasn't going to take the sticker off because I love it, and I haven't been able to find an equivalent. And there aren't as many women leading Fortune 500 companies as there ought to be. But isn't that fascinating? It's a Forbes study a month ago, 25th of October. Women who head big companies are doing twice as well as men in, in performance. It's the first time there's been data like this. This is the way I described it to a MasterCard meeting in Vienna a week ago. Women decide, women save, women spend, women rule. As I said, game over. It's okay for you. You've got gray hair. It's not so good for him. <laughs> so that's my story. Hilton, Howard, Herb, Henry I, Henry II, Shea, and Helgeson. And it adds up to this. Sweat the details, stay in touch. It's all about people, small courtesies, big payoff, most tries win, wow, and women rule. <laughs> and it's not the list in particular that Peter would have written, but the fundamental ideas, I believe, the clarity, the simplicity. I got to give a speech. I got to be invited to do this again in a couple of years, you know? because this is the second time I've done it. And you know, you get involved in the hurdy-gurdy of life and you kind of forget the basics, where they get complexified. And I, I'm going to be, if God is willing, and I live to Peter's age or Warren's age, I'm going to keep doing this because I'm so pissed off. <laughs> Bob Waterman was interviewed in Business Week years ago, and he said, what keeps Tom going? He said, he's really pissed off all the time. <laughs> and I'm pissed off because this isn't, this is hard, but it's not exotic. It says, visit 25 shops. It says, say thank you. You know, I was in Vienna. A woman from MasterCard came up to me. She had she remembered about 10 years before she had gotten a job. 80 people were interviewed for the job, all right? It was a pretty technical job. So you know darn well that all 80 of them had the fundamental technical requirements, right? 80 people interviewed. They told her after she got the job she was the only one who sent thank you notes to the people who interviewed her for having spent the time interviewing her. If she hadn't been technically qualified, she wouldn't have gotten the job. I'm not an idiot, and I'm not arguing that. And so i got to come back a couple of years from now because i got to keep remembering that the basics and the moral stuff and the like is what's important. So um, my time is close to the end, but I would love to take a handful of questions if you've got questions on any topic whatsoever. I'd be happy to recount the San Francisco Giants <laughs> victories one pitch at a time. I would be happy to go on for half an hour on Tim Lincecum. Nobody struck out on a ball that was in the, tr in the strike zone. When they did those repeats, it was like guys, boys making $5 million making fools of themselves. I, you know why I remember that? I'll, you know why I remembered that? 
I grew up with Baltimore and the Baltimore Orioles. First time we won a World Series was against Los Angeles in 1966. I was in the Navy. I was in Vietnam. We had four pitchers, one of whom was 19 years old. We beat the Dodgers four zip, and I listened to every pitch on Mars radio in a tent outside of Da Nang. And I haven't been so happy since 1966. 